My name is Neil McKenzie. I'm director of marketing uh, here at Universal. I am here at High Point and I have my mask handy just in case. Um, Corey is up in New York and uh, has been kind enough to join us this afternoon to, I think, kind of touch on a topic that certainly has been top of mind for many. Uh, and I think we all have a different perspective in terms of how it might impact, you know, both personal and professional lives. Um, but Corey, for those that, of you that don't know Corey, he is a national claimed uh, designer. He has a new book coming out. Um, he is a tastemaker. He is a, a great guy, uh, quite stylish as well. And uh, I think it's, um, I think he'll offer a lot of perspective uh, on this particular topic. And we uh, we're glad to uh, that you were able to make time for us, Corey, and uh, thank you. And I'll uh, I'll be quiet now and let you take it away. Thank you, Neil. So good to see all of you virtually. An honor to be here. Let's begin our discussion. Four letters. Four letters. The combination of which creates by far one of the most controversial, divisive and uncomfortable words in our vocabulary. And yet, when utilized properly, this four-letter word can actually galvanize people towards a common goal of unity. What is this four-letter word? R-A-C-E. Race. Yes, race as a word or topic certainly engenders in people great emotion. And for better or worse, it is consciously and subconsciously on our minds. Now, some people believe that race isn't really a problem here in the United States. That's a problem of the distant past. They claim that perhaps they don't see color because they genuinely believe that all people are created equal. Others think that the topic of race and racism is a topic that is quite overblown or perhaps exaggerated. And many believe that the issue is systemic and has kept our country from moving forward towards peaceful relations. And then of course, finally, you do have a large number of individuals who do believe that they are superior to other people simply because of their skin color and their culture. Now 2020 has certainly been a year of mental and emotional whiplash, has it not? This year saw the confluence of two historic moments with global impacts. The COVID-19 pandemic certainly sent all of us reeling, shut down our entire planet all at once overnight. And then at the same time, this, this uh, past spring, a multicultural, multi-generational alliance formed, protesting racial injustice. While racial inequality has long been a major topic of conversation for hundreds of years, it seems as if this particular issue has really crystallized in the last uh, several months. So considering how controversial, how uncomfortable really, the topic of race is, many interior designers, architects, and industry professionals are wondering, how can I better understand the sensitivities of race in our workplace? How could I avoid saying the wrong thing when I'm engaged in a sensitive discussion on race? Is there really a difference between Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter? And finally, what are some practical ways to get involved and show my support for diversity in our industry? Well, if you're taking notes or perhaps uh, writing down things through your iPad or your phone, I have five takeaways in this discussion uh, for our benefit, five points. And I'll read them off first now, and then we're gonna go back and investigate each one individually. The five takeaways are as follows. Number one, we must do our homework. Number two, we must listen more and respond less. Number three, remember that people are not monolithic. Number four, seeing color is not always racist. And finally, number five, Beware of social media viruses. So let's talk about those individual points uh, again. Let's start with doing our homework. What does it mean to do our homework if we're going to build this diverse industry uh, for the interior design creative world? Well, the first step in really creating a more diverse environment in our industry 
involves understanding what race is and take it for what it really is. In fact, the Webster's Dictionary describes and defines racism this way, and I quote, as prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against a person or people on the basis of their membership of a particular racial or ethnic group, typically one that is a minority or marginalized. So that's the definition of racism. That's what bigotry and racism is, you know, basically painting a large group of people with one brush. Generally, people have prejudices against other individuals or groups of people because of ignorance. They may not be very well versed in other cultures or the plights of their neighbors and their coworkers. The best way to overcome that ignorance is by simply getting to know people who look different from us, seeking out their association and then working towards inclusion. What does that mean in reality? How do we put that into practice? Well, we have to do research, do our homework on what other groups and minorities have faced due to their race or their religion. African Americans, people of the Jewish background, Latinx community, Native Americans, LGBTQ, Asian Americans, and women have all endured terrible mistreatment and discrimination simply for the way they look or have been born. So the best way for you and I to build this diverse community is by simply learning about people that we want to include and in understanding more about what they've experienced in their lives as Americans and most importantly, as humans. Ask yourself this question. When was the last time that I deliberately took the time to look up a culture or race or people in my community that was different from me, to learn more about the way they worship, the way they love, the way they live? If it's been a long time, or we can't think of the last time we took the moments to do some research on someone that's different than us, that can underscore perhaps a, a, a space for improvement to really work towards inclusivity and uh, diversity in our industry. In fact, that old cliche that we often use, knowledge is power, it really does come true in this situation because doing our homework about those who are different from us will dis help us to dismiss any ignorance, any stereotypes, any misconceptions we may have about those people. And it also will help build for us a comfort zone in being around such individuals. It will enable us to really be more inclusive. So that's our first point. We need to do our homework. What about our second point? We need to listen more and respond less. So we've gotten out our Google, right? We've done some research. We've looked up several uh, cultures and religions and people, different racial backgrounds, and we've learned a lot about these different groups in our communities. Um, we now know a lot more about them. So now that we've done that research, are we now experts qualified to wade into that next contentious Facebook battle or debate on race relations? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Conversations on race can be very difficult. They can be very awkward, very uncomfortable, but they are important to have. If we approach those conversations, especially ones online or at the dinner table with friends and family, from the angle of learning and imparting knowledge, then all parties who are present will benefit. However, there are times though when it may be best to simply listen more and respond less. I think sometimes so many people, especially when they're in a, in a heated conversation or debate, they listen to reply. You know what I mean? Like someone's talking at them and they're listening, but they're not really hearing the words. They're listening, but they're thinking from the angle of, okay, what am I going to respond with next to combat or defeat this person in this debate? But if we're listening to learn and to really hear what's being said, that will enable us to absorb the words and take them to heart. And that also enables us to ask tactful questions and then listen carefully to the responses. And that will help us to learn and to become more informed and grow in our understanding of the differences between us and also, most importantly, the similarities between us. I'll give you an example. Let's talk about Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter. I have a dear friend of mine who is Jewish. 
And when the George Floyd um, murder took place earlier this year and all the protests took place and people were of all different colors and backgrounds were heralding Black Lives Matter, he took me aside and he asked the question, why Black Lives Matter? Why not call it All Lives Matter? Don't All Lives Matter? And I said, of course they do. I, can't, I have no problem saying All Lives Matter because I do believe that's the case. But there are some people who do have a problem with saying that Black Lives Matter. And so I use an illustration and analogy that I want to share with you all today. You have 10 toes on your two feet. Each toe lends itself to the balance of how we walk every day, correct? If you break one of those toes, does it mean that the other nine toes no longer have value? Of course not. It simply means that until that one toe is mended, you're going to be hobbling along in pain, right? And that's what Black Lives Matter is really calling about. It's one particular group of people, one toe out of 10, for example, that has been broken, that is in pain, and is crying out for support and for help to be bound up and to heal. Clearly, there's still some work that needs to be done because the country and the world continues to hobble along in pain because this particular toe is broken still. It, it needs some attention, some assistance, some support. But here's the thing, this is why I told my friend, there are other toes, like I mentioned, the Latino community, the LGBTQ community, women, Asian Americans, Native Americans, there's so many different toes on that foot and each of them can be broken. If we don't stop, stoop down and help each other when each community goes through discrimination or hardship or pain or mistreatment, then again, we'll continue to hobble along in pain until we get the point. So yes, all lives matter, but until black lives matter, we can't really say that all lives matter, can we? And it's not that we perhaps don't believe that. We may truly understand and believe that all lives matter and black lives matter. But until everyone else around us also believes that, hence the, 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 the ceasing of brutality and, and, uh, and cruel treatment, um, we can't really say that fairly. And I mentioned to him, him being Jewish, I said, you can understand where I'm coming from because your people underwent terrible uh, atrocities. And he said, I, I get it, I get it. We all are in this together. We're basically on the same foot, on the same team, if you will. So by asking me tactful questions, my Jewish friend was enlightened. He figured out a, a, a topic that he had been curious about and it enabled him to go forward and feel educated and enlightened to help other people. And I also felt enlightened and encouraged from the interchange because he had the courage to ask those questions. Again, the benefit of listening more and speaking less. Let's talk about that third point. Remember that people are not monolithic. The biggest mistake that bigots and racists make is painting large swaths of people or communities with one big stereotypical brush. Judging an entire community based on the behavior or the beliefs of some is what leads to discrimination. For example, I personally believe that peaceful protests are essential to American democracy. Think about it. The fight for women's rights, the fight for civil rights, the fight for interracial marriage. These are all things that we as a country, as a, as, as a human species have waged for and, and, and have fought for through joining forces as people and marching and letting our thoughts be known in a physical, in a physical visible way. However, although I do support peaceful protest, I am 100% against looting. I despise rioting. And as someone who is an interior designer, who is dedicated to creating and building beautiful things, I hate destruction of property. So even though I am a man of color, I would never participate in some of the, the, the destructive, damaging behavior you may see in the media and on the news. In other words, African Americans are not a monolith. We're not all the same. There are as many differences among us as there are among any other community or culture of people around us. 
To promote diversity in our industry, therefore, we must effectively give everyone we deal with, everyone we come in contact with, a fair chance. The benefit of the doubt to prove who they are as an individual. And we should expect other people to give us that same courtesy. It is wrong, it is bigoted, it is unfair to simply copy and paste bad experiences or stereotypes against others who look, sound, or live differently from us. Point number four, seeing color is not always racist. What do I mean by that? Well, my Jewish friend, let's go back to him for a moment. <laughs> uh, he, he and I were sitting down talking about um, the racist issue, the racism issue again, and he brought up uh, the point that he does not see color. He said, I don't even see color. I see you as a human being because I believe that all people are uh, born equal. And I appreciate that. I know that his, in his heart, his, his motives were, were proper in saying that, that point. But we started talking about his, his, um, his background, his people, the Jews. How, as I mentioned earlier, they suffered unspeakable atrocities at the hands of the Nazis in Germany. When they came here to the States, his people, his family, his ancestors, they were able to change their last names and then assimilate into society. They were able to accumulate generational wealth for themselves and then pass it down to their children. So I asked him, why is it that you think your, your great, great grandfather and, and ancestors were able to move here from Germany, from Europe, and assimilate into American culture and change your last names and be able to build a new life for yourselves. Why do you think that is? And he thought about it for a moment and he said, it's because we're white. And I said, yeah, even though you are Jewish, because of your skin complexion, you were able to change your, your last name and assimilate into this culture. As a dark skinned minority, <laughs> I don't get to blend in. I will always be a brown skinned man of color. So I told him, when you say, I don't see color, in a way, even though it's not intentional, what you're really saying is you don't see the struggle that I have to face because of a genetic color of my skin that I simply cannot change. You're not choosing to see or unable to see perhaps the plight that I face as a, as a fellow human. And I used for him another example, because he was like, oh, wow, that's, I never thought of it that way. And so I said, let me, let me illustrate to you this way, because we're talking about diversity. It's more than just African-Americans or LGBTQ. Let's talk about women who are also a minority that face gross discrimination, sexism, and abuse. I said, I have an all-female staff. If one of them came to me at the office and said, Corey, I am being sexually harassed by a subcontractor on the construction site. I have lost sleep over it. I, it tears down my self-esteem. I feel worthless. Uh, it's really bothering me and it's really interrupting my performance here at the office. Um, it just really makes me feel terrible that this guy continues to hit on me or say improper, offensive, you know, off-color jokes uh, to me as a woman. If I responded to her and said, well, I don't see gender. I don't see your gender. How would she feel? How would she interpret that comment from me? Would it not come across incredibly insensitive? If I told her, I don't see your gender, then basically I'm saying that I am just dismissing her struggles as a woman. That I'm not giving credence to the fact that she faces things that are unique to her as a woman. I don't have to be a woman to empathize with the struggle that she is facing. So when a person says, I don't see color, that means that they're perhaps overlooking the bigger picture, the bigger story. When most people say that, what they are meaning to say is that they don't judge people because of their skin color, and that is good. But perhaps we may need to retire that phrase because it is unintentionally dismissive to those who do feel invisible, who do feel that people uh, don't give them a fair shot because of the discrimination they may feel or face on a daily basis. Let's examine our fifth point. Beware of social viruses. Now, while the COVID-19 pandemic is certainly 
uh, causing incredible disruption across planet Earth and has, um, like I mentioned earlier, produced a emotional and mental whiplash for all of us. That's one virus, a physical health virus that we have to be on the lookout for. But we also have to be mindful of social viruses that can chip away at who we are on the inside as human beings. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there's an old adage that misery loves company. Perhaps you've heard that statement before. During this time period uh, where there is so much unrest and so much controversy, we must be careful to avoid or perhaps limit association with people, even well-intentioned ones, who by default hold a negative view of certain communities or races. Pessimistic, sarcastic people can do a lot of damage to creative professionals. They may say things on their social media platforms that can really sap us of our energy or uh, help us uh, maybe think differently about building a diverse uh, design community. So what does that mean in practice? It means we have to be very judicious with who we choose to put in our orbits at this time because even our closest friends or even family members can unwillingly put cracks in our resolve to be more diverse and inclusive in our relationships with other people. This is especially true on social media platforms like Facebook and other chat rooms. It brings us into contact with people or, or bots, if you will, um, that can, they, they, they produce poisonous language and poisonous uh, thinking patterns that can damage us. It can be quite discouraging. In fact, it may be wise to periodically Take a break from such platforms, especially if we are already feeling down and discouraged. So those are our five points, five different things that we can do to build a more diverse community as a creative uh, industry. So in conclusion, none of us may know what the future may hold for us, our families, our businesses, our way of life. We simply cannot control that. We can only control how we react to what's happening around us and how we treat each other. As the makeup of our country continues to become more culturally diverse, so too will our design industry. So what does that mean? It means that all of us must do our part to become more inclusive. Now, how can we put that into practice in a more practical way? Well, we can hire qualified minority-owned workrooms and contractors to assist us uh, with our projects. We can select qualified minorities to participate in show houses and on speaking panels because as we all know, representation is quite key. We can be cognizant of featuring designers of color in print magazines and on our blogs. And most importantly of all, we should continue to listen and learn as much as we can about those that are different from us or that we may not know. This, racist, um, this racism topic is exhausting. It's a lot. And I feel like all of us have had our, our minds and hearts full and overwhelmed by this particular topic this year. And I like to look at it as like running a relay race, right? You, you, you start the finish at the start point and you start running. And we've come a long way. We have certainly come a long way as a species when it comes to race relations. But we have a long way to go. And it's exhausting to keep running that race. But it is so worth it. It is so vital. It's so important. By staying engaged, all of us can collectively change. We can, we can transform the stigma that surrounds that four-letter word, R-A-C-E, race. One day we can transform that word to mean something simpler and inspirational. How about something like this? Race is something you run and win. Doesn't that sound better? Absolutely. Thank you all so much for tuning in and special thanks to Neil and Universal Furniture for hosting this event and having me on. Please stay in touch with me on Instagram at Corey Damon Jenkins and enjoy your High Point Market. Um, stay safe and stay healthy. Um, Neil, back to you. Corey, that was, uh, that was great. I think I uh, really appreciate you leading that conversation. I think there's a lot of good points to think about, digest, um, 
and uh, again, I think it's just one of those things to, as we all look to continue to educate ourselves, continue the conversation, uh, continue listening um, as opposed to just reacting. I think those all, all of those things are, are so useful. And I think so just simple things that you simple. kind of take a <laughs> breath and, and think about, but I think it's, it is. And I know I have a, a daughter, she's, she's nine years old and there's a, obviously a lot going on in the world right now. And it's an, it's an interesting time, but I think this was, um, I think you did a great job just talking through that. So we really appreciate you uh, leading this conversation. Um, if there's any questions, you can chat it to us. I haven't seen any pop through. Um, we are going to be, um, I mentioned we've, we've recorded this. We will be sending it out to uh, everyone that registered. And then we're also going to replay this during our virtual market, uh, November 16th and 17th. So we'll be sending out some more information on that. But um, if there are any questions, feel free to chat away now. If not, uh, we again appreciate everybody uh, making time. So give everybody a second here. But um, um, I think I don't, I don't know. Oh, here's, here is one. Yeah, well, from L.P. Patterson. Yes. Thank you for asking a question. Uh, you're seeing this too, right, Corey? I saw the first few letters and then it goes okay. still like this. So, <laughs> so. I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll read it out and okay. I'll let you. Um, as a Latina designer, I constantly feel unwanted and unwelcomed. Uh, a, sim uh, a simple helps so much. Uh, and, and a simple, I think she might just be saying, I don't know what the second sentence is referring to, but um, smile. Yes, a smile is nice. It is nice to smile. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, yeah. I remember, I think that's, yeah, I remember, you know, one of the, I think most important, important lessons I ever learned from my principal was when I was in first grade, common courtesy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, that is a that is a good question and uh, and point. Uh, so we thank you for making that. And um, yep. and Corey's got a great smile, and I think <laughs> we can all smile a little bit more. And hopefully we can see them soon too. <laughs> so, um, um, all right, great. Well, um, Corey, thank you for for leading this conversation, and um, we hope to see you in person really soon. Um, yeah, hopefully in and, April. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, stay safe. Best of luck uh, up in New York with everything. And um, thank you again for your time. Thanks for having me. You guys stay safe and be healthy. And we'll see you guys hopefully in, in the spring. Absolutely. God, yes. Please. <laughs> Take care, Neil. Take Thanks care. So thank you. Bye, All right. Bye -bye. Thank you.